you guys are awake. I know you are. Thank you for your Yeah. What a day to start a, a new session. It's great. Thank you for uh, thanks for joining us on our first uh, first press conference, our first press availability of the uh, the new legislative session. Uh, last night, I outlined uh, my vision for Alaska's future, uh, how we intend to better protect Alaskans and communities that have no law enforcement, how we intend to provide uh, energy solutions for Alaskans, how we intend to get Alaska's gas to Alaskans, and how we intend to get new production uh, for Alaskans as well. So I'm happy to talk with you about those, about those topics and look forward to our discussion. I'm gonna, you know what? I don't think I've ever started with you, Bob, but I'm happy to do that at the beginning. <laughs> Hope Springs a great tradition, you think? Okay. Um, the, you discussed the labor issues and taxes that are too high on employment mm -hmm. taxes. Could you give us more details on that plan? Yeah, you bet. We'll, my understanding is we'll be, we'll be filing the bill tomorrow, but um, effectively the unemployment uh, insurance trust fund is the fund that funds unemployment payments um, that we fund unemployment payments out of and every year we collect money from Alaskans from the hard-working Alaskans and from Alaskan employers unemployment contributions out of their paychecks and we we put pay those into the fund that fund is really overfunded for our needs and we have in law an automatic escalator on uh, payments coming out of Alaskans paychecks and this last year for example there's an automatic increase of 20 million dollars even though the fund is solvent and can meet our obligations and I just figured it was time to give Alaskans a break uh, over 12,000 Alaska small businesses pay that uh, virtually everybody in the private sector uh, pays those unemployment contributions so what and would your bill do exactly? the bill would set up a formula to uh, determine that the fund is solvent and if the fund is solvent give the Commissioner of Labor the discretion uh, to cut those taxes to uh, hard-working Alaskans and Alaska businesses so you'll see more more details on that uh, here in the next 24 hours I'm gonna let I'll let you look at the bill because I'm not gonna I don't want to re number one I don't want to misstate what what's in the bill uh, I want to make sure we, and I don't have the language in front of me so I'm we'll leave that till you see it Becky Yeah. The companies, when they met their benchmarks, all the benchmarks last year, sent you a packet that talked about a timeline and some of the things that would need to be met. And under concept selection, heading into pre feed, one of those included long term certainty on fiscal situation, or the fiscal situation, oil and gas. How realistic is it that they meet February 15th, given there's virtually no way we're going to have certainty by that point? And have you talked to the companies about that timeline? they don't need changes in gas taxes to make a project concept selection so that's that's number one number two my priority is to get Alaskans gas to Alaskans first and to get it now and last year what I saw was when I set aggressive benchmarks uh, the companies up their game and responded and they actually met those benchmarks they got Point Thompson resolved with us as a state they got aligned as parties around a large diameter pipeline project first time there were three producers and a pipeline company aligned around a project um, I saw the benefit of setting kind of high and aggressive goals to get Alaskans gas and I do believe the February 15 deadline is achievable to and I, I believe it's responsible for Alaskans to require that of these companies tell us what you're planning tell us what you're going to build um, are they going to make the commitment to, to build the gas line then? No. But they are making that project concept selection of an all Alaska gas line. Um, I did speak with company representatives ahead of it. Um, I did, I, you know, there was, I could characterize um, the conversations as um, positive in that I believe the goal is achievable. I don't think. Uh, there was extreme there wasn't happiness on any side you know <laughs> but I, I really feel there's a need to, to move this forward and to set aggressive goals so there's another goal in there too and that's the the commercial agreement by this spring and a full summer of field work um, this summer I think if those pieces are in place Alaskans will know um, what is 
in it for them, and then we can talk about fiscals at that point. That's, that's, that's kind of the order of things. Alaskans deserve to know what's going to be, what the plan is before we're asked to give up uh, anything on, on the gas tax side of things. You said 2013 last year for gas tax, no? Right? Pardon me? You said 2013 for... I, that was correct through this, this calendar year. But again, that assumes that Alaskans um, have a plan in front of them. Yeah. And one follow-up that when, when you talked about um, finalizing an agreement to advance into pre-feed, what goes into that type of agreement? Can you, in simpler English, I guess, to explain what, what that next step would be by spring? By, well, by spring, they have, to, they have to sign a commercial agreement together to move forward into the field season and, and to move forward into pre Pre-feed. They have to sign that agreement that uh, sets forth those details among among them as parties. And what that means for Alaskans is that they are they are. And once once that's done, the agreement's signed, and once a vote's taken, once that's in place, they're moving into a, a a phase of the project where hundreds of millions of dollars are being spent, private sector dollars. And that, to me, that's real money. You know, there's no question about it. So, yeah. Um, when you mentioned uh, uh, the merger between the AGDC project and the APP project, yeah. um, you know how how much longer are we going to be, or would we look at doing work with AGDC before we say that we need to have a merger? Is there a, do they advance to an open season, or and I guess what does that merger look like? If I knew exactly what the merger looked like, we'd be doing it right now. But we're taking steps to bring about that merger, so we are. What you heard me say last night was that I want to boost the capability of AGDC to represent the state's interests in a gas pipeline project. I want them to be able to build a gas line on their own or to participate in a gas line uh, being built by themselves and others. So if we can boost that capacity, it gives the state a vehicle by which um, to build or own all or part of a gas line. But to have, a, to have a gas line, you also need gas supply. And that's where the parties that are aligned in the APP project, uh, they bring that to the table. They bring not only a pipeline builder, they bring uh, three companies who can put more gas into the pipe than what AGDC originally conceived. You, you see now AGDC has moved to a larger diameter pipe. And on the other side, we have companies with more gas that could go into that pipe. So that's, that's the design down, down the road is a, is a merger of these two paths. Let me, let me just get somebody else, Bob. Go ahead. Uh, one thing you didn't mention uh, in your speech last night, uh, whole lot, Governor, uh, was uh, the issue of transportation. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, uh, I, I'm curious to hear more about uh, what your transportation plan is. Uh, for the you bet. Here. You know, when I, um, as I was getting ready with the State of the State, it, it's, and I've told a, a couple members of the press corps this, you, as a governor, have to decide whether to include every um, priority of your administration and every stakeholder um, that there could possibly be in a speech. And you could end up with a long laundry list where you mention three lines about everybody, or you could give a speech like I did on about five or six topics and speak more, more wholly or fully. That doesn't diminish from the other areas or, or minimize them in any way. And on the transportation side of the, the equation, our administration's, one of our top priorities, uh, as you've heard me speak to, is our transportation um, infrastructure. So that's roads, our roads to resources um, are, are funded in our, in our budget. Uh, we've recently changed direction on the, on the ferry system to make sure that we get uh, ferries built on budget by Alaskans for Alaskans. So you'll see a continued emphasis on um, opening opportunities for Alaskans through our transportation infrastructure. Yeah. Hi, Governor. Um, you didn't ask for a BSA increase. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to accept an education increase as long as it comes from the legislature, or is that a line in the sand for your budget? So at this point, I've dri you know I've drawn very few lines in the sand, as you as you've said. This is a, the beginning of a legislature. Um, everything's open for discussion, but I do have uh, some principles there with respect to education funding, and that is that it's got to <coughs> deliver results for our kids and parents. And over the last um, five years we have had record increases in education funding, um, hundreds of millions of extra dollars that were not uh, funded before are now being funded on an annual basis. 
with graduation rates at below, just below 70 percent. That is not a passing grade. We can do better. Is it going to take more money? Yes, no question. But that money needs to buy results for our kids and our families. And that's, that's what we'll be focused on. So for example, last year, um, when we had this discussion over increased education funding, we said, we agreed with the legislature, look, we know heating costs and fuel costs are going up by $25 million. Here's $25 million that will address those increased heating costs. That is a $25 million increase in the classroom because that money that was there doesn't have to, doesn't have to go to those increased heating costs. Um, if, we can, if we can focus our money on results, and I, I just had a discussion uh, this morning uh, with um, some, our local Juno representatives um, at, the, at the city level. Basically, I told them if, if there are results that money can be tied to, then I'm, I'm open to that kind, of, uh, that kind of increase. It's accountability for, for the people's money. Yeah. Sean McConnell, Alaska Education Update. My question segues right into that. Yesterday at the Senate Education Committee hearing, Commissioner Hanley said they would need an appropriation to fully implement the new teacher evaluation regulation. <coughs> but he said they don't need that to begin the program. Do you know at what fiscal year you might request an appropriation and how much it will be? That's actually a better question for him and for the Board of Education. They still have to uh, work with the local districts on how to, how to develop those and implement them. And that all will tie together with the appropriation uh, requests. So just unknown at this time? Unknown by me, but not by them. They, okay. The Board of Education would have a better sense on how long it'll take them to put together a regs package and work with the Department of Education on those issues. And that would be something that would be acceptable to you because it would be that type of appropriation would be acceptable? That type of appropriation, yes. You know, blanket, open-ended, open book check of the, from the People's Treasury, no. You know, it's, it's all in what's proposed and, and what, what the legislators think of it as well. Oh, wait, let's get somebody else who hasn't. Go ahead, Dan. Adam Pinsker, KDU. Um, you, you talked, you mentioned last slide about those four points, uh, four conditions for oil tax reform. Mm -hmm. uh, are you willing to me sit down with some folks in the Democratic minority who are concerned about the negative fiscal impact that this uh, bill would have and maybe work with them to, to, to maybe see some more guarantees that the oil companies reinvest their profits uh, back into the state of Alaska? Always have been. Um, I mean, they're here right now, a couple of them. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of funny you mentioned that because the current system um, – isn't fair to Alaskans because it doesn't protect us as well on the downside as it could. It's not fair to Alaskans to be sliding in production and doing nothing about it. Uh, so the current system that a number of uh, the gentlemen and, and individuals you mentioned, uh, the status quo is not acceptable to Alaskans. It's a short-term view to say that because there is on the fiscal note in a snapshot in time, $800 million less in revenue in one year, that's a short-term way of, of looking at um, oil production in our future. I'm always open to having that conversation. I think, um, I think you all could envision a scenario very soon where oil goes to $90 a barrel. And in this bill, that $90 a barrel, we, the state of Alaska is better protected than under the current system. So. To, to say, oh man, it's, it's going to you know, result in this much less money uh, for sure, it's a balancing act. It's, it's taking less at the high end of oil prices and taking more at the lower end. That's what's more fair and balanced about this approach than the current system. Also, we're not, we're not under the system where we've proposed to eliminate the tax credits. Next, about next year, we're going to be responsible for about a billion dollars worth of tax credits. That's basically a check from the Treasury back to the companies. So they're supporting a system that's writing a check back to the companies, even if, even if oil prices fall and we don't get that additional revenue. So, you know, there's no, there's no way to uh, plausibly argue that, that this um, reduction in revenue is absolutely the way it's going to be. Because if, if it's 100 percent true that our, our fiscal um, fiscal note is 100 percent 
on target, meaning that we absolutely know what the price of oil is going to be for the next year or two years, which we know <coughs> to a better degree than before. I say that's, that's a small price to pay if we're actually having a future of new production and new revenue out into the future. I'm not in this for the short term for Alaskans. I'm in it for the long term. And I think Alaskans are too. So, yeah, go ahead. Um, you said Alaskans want to see what they're going to get for their money when it comes to education. And you said Alaskans want to see what they're going to get for their money when it comes to natural gas bill. Mm -hmm. Are you going to impose that condition on your oil tax bill? Or we already have. We already have. And we've seen the results. So for example, uh, we lowered taxes on on the head tax and the, um, on the cruise ships out here, and we saw more ships come back. In this bill, to get, the, to get the GRE, the Guaranteed Revenue Exclusion, to get the lower taxes under that provision, it, they've got to produce new oil from legacy fields, from a new participating area, or from a new field. So to get the maximum benefit of the, of the tax incentives in this bill, there has to be new production. So that's, that's the difference between the current system. I mean, right now, we're writing checks for tax credits that don't necessarily lead to new production. And that's the system being supported by the Democrats that you just you just raised, Becky. It is a rate of new production that would be required sufficient. Or how sufficient is it? How close does it come to closing the state fiscal year? Okay, so so here's let's that's a that there's also a false premise in there that let's just talk about for a second. <coughs> Under the current system, our budget reserves are scheduled to run out in ten years. Now we can either wait to do something for 10 years and take the you know head in the sand kind of approach, or we can do something now that has the that has the possibility and the potential for changing um, changing that outcome 10 years from now. That's that's what I'm looking at is how to change the long term while we still have budget reserves to cover ourselves and while there's still time. But who's taking the head in the sand? Even the head in the, the sand. The end of the room are saying they. I haven't seen another plan that actually addresses and balances these guiding principles. So I'm happy to happy to consider that when it comes. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, last night you put a lot of emphasis on online learning uh, to improve educational outcomes in rural Alaska. And I'm just wondering what telecommunications infrastructure you would need to see in place to facilitate mm -hmm. that. Well, certainly um, broadband would be an issue. But the, the digital learning initiative is not just about the interconnectedness for the internet. It's also about um, collaboration in the classroom together and being able to communicate and work together. And so digital learning just provides that accessibility to greater educational resources through the internet as well as in the classroom and among, among students and teachers. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Um, in a lot of the rural communi uh, communities, there there really isn't, <coughs> you know, broadband accessibility. And I just wondered if you would support you know, uh, providing more money for that and, and what the possibility there is. I have I I have already in a significant way from the federal government, but I've, I'd also be willing to look at that from the state side. Let me go in the back here. Go ahead. Where did you come up with the five percent for new oil tax? Where did that come from? Where did I get my, get the what? From the five percent for new oil tax. Five percent for new oil. Five percent tax on new oil. Is that is that right? Am I wrong? Twenty-five percent no. on what, what is it? Mike, fish, why don't you come up here, please? Sorry, Mike Pulaski. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe you can flush out what she's asking. I thought I saw a press release from Sharon. Is that, didn't you say twenty-five percent for existing fields and five percent tax on new oil? No. No, the the provision in the bill is a base twenty five percent tax rate as it exists yeah. in the current system today. Everybody. Everybody. Yeah. The incentive for new production is the gross revenue exclusion, which is 20% of the gross value. Okay. That applies specifically to the new barrels that are produced. The base tax is the same at 25% everywhere. So on new oil, there's no, there's no, I mean, what, can, can you speak in plain language about what that means for new oil production? Like sure. How much, like, total, how much, how much the effective tax rate would be? We'd have to look at the effective tax rate specifically, but generally speaking, what you're seeing is that 20% of that gross value of the new oil is excluded from the tax calculation. So basically, 80% of the value of that new oil is taxed at 25%. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Bill. Uh, just a clarification on your gas line timeline. Uh, 
Um, so we go through the commercial agreement, the field work this summer. Then it's appropriate to talk about gas fiscal terms. Uh, so two questions. One is, uh, is that contemplate a special session in the fall? Secondly, where is the um, make or break point on this merger? Um, at what point do, does AGDC say, eh, you know what, we got to move ahead. We can't wait for the I think that's what we're doing now. I mean, that's why I set the benchmarks. That's why I supported uh, the, the Representative Chenault or, and the Speaker and Representative Hawker in their legislation in terms of um, moving that forward through the committee process and working with them on, on getting that move. So we're not waiting. No, I understand. But what's the tripwire? What is the moment where you say, and what, are the re what would the reasons be where you would say, big line's not happening fast enough, we have to go with gas to Alaskans now? That's what I'm doing now. I mean, that's why Point Thompson is being built now. That's why I've set benchmarks now on the APP project. That's why we're moving to empower AGDC now with greater power. You can't, it's not just like you can, you can turn on a light switch and all of a sudden it's merged. I, there are, um, Alaskans deserve to have this done right and they deserve it done now. And that's, that's these are the steps I'm taking. Adam. I want to touch on the uh, public safety aspect of your speech from last night. You mentioned you wanted to get 15 more VPSOs and 15 more state troopers. Are yeah. you asking the legislature to approve the money for all, all those all at once? Yes. Phase them in? Okay. No, no. I've, um, I've worked uh, with legislators, and I, frankly, I made a promise when I came into office that I would be adding 15 more VPSOs uh, per year for that, that near-term period. And I've kept that promise. Uh, because we had many communities and have many communities still that have no law enforcement presence whatsoever. And so they'll make a phone call um, in a domestic violence situation and try to get help, but they don't have anybody in the community to help them. Uh, they have to count on friends and relatives to, to help out. So we've taken that seriously, but at the same time, uh, we have had um, our resources strained with population growth in the Matsu, Fairbanks, and the Kenai Peninsula. And so it's been a while since we've we funded troop, new troopers on a one or two person basis, but um, we're really trying to um, up our abilities as um, a law enforcement agency by putting new troopers in those those three areas as well. Uh, not to mention as well an additional trooper support for the VPSOs. So um, that's that is the uh, uh, the intervention component of our our Choose Respect initiative is additional law enforcement as well as the legislation that um, I spoke to last night related to domestic violence, sexual assault and trafficking and working to um, increase penalties there and, and create stronger protections for victims. So that, that omnibus bill um, is also another element in this legislative session that I'm asking lawmakers to pass. So there's a, this year, uh, there, are, there are actually prevention elements in the, in the budget. There are, there are intervention elements um, in the budget as well as uh, through legislation. So, Becky. So on the on the um, the school safety front, the uh, commissioner Hanley is reaching out to every school district in the state uh, to ascertain what their high priority needs are, um, whether it's uh, access issues to the school, whether it's hardware issues, whether it's training for personnel, uh, school resources, you know, personnel, and. I've asked him to, to do that inventory so that we can have a, have a discussion with, with legislators about um, our schools and how to better provide the, those safe classrooms for our young people. When it comes to reading uh, and early literacy, that's proceeding on a number of fronts. Certainly, um, we're gonna continue to support uh, efforts like Best Beginnings, but digital learning, frankly, is, is another key element um, as part of increasing literacy. And uh, we'd, I'd be happy to get, uh, get a more full Fold this for you there to help. Yeah, last year you talked about the idea of social promotion and not wanting to see that continue past third grade. Is that going to be part of this? Are you going to put something in a bill or legislation that would um, you know, speak to ending that, I don't want to say tradition, but you know, having that child, children advance if they're not ready? 
I think it's a huge concern, and I, I do I do not believe um, kids should be socially promoted. I think they should be promoted to fourth grade when they can read. And um, have I do I have plans to file legislation at this point? Uh, I don't, but I have considered it and will consider it. I'm actually I, I, my hope is that I can have discussions with with legislators about how best to go about doing that because um, I know. I know teachers don't want to do that, uh, but I also know some of the pressures of, of uh, uh, moving kids along, and uh, it just does a disservice to our, our children and to our community and, and workforce in the future. So I knew this was going to excite oh, you. Go ahead. Non-promotion. Does that yeah. include um, children who've been identified as special education and who are capable mentally of working at a higher level but just can't read? I think those are all discussions I'm open to, okay. I mean, clearly. And that's exactly why I don't have a bill right now, is I think there are a number of, of um, issues to be addressed um, and to further that discussion. I welcome that discussion with the education committees if they want to have, have that discussion. Okay, now we have folks online. Okay, why don't you go ahead and go online. Operator, could you take us off lecture mode, please? Ready for online Q&A? Thank you. We have questions. What's your second question? <laughs> well, I'd like to hear the answer to that one. The second one, I just was interested in what you said about primacy and dredge and fill. Are you wanting to take over what the Corps of Engineers does? Do you want um, uh, you know, to, to uh, eliminate Clean Water Act permits? Can you do that? Who's going to pay? I'm, I didn't understand what that was all about, but I'm interested in, in what your ideas are. Okay, thanks. You know, it's kind of interesting, and, and uh, a couple of my friendly colleagues from across the aisle are here with us this morning, and uh, I was hearing comments from them before they'd even read the bill, and that's something that causes me concern is when you actually publish comments about, you know, from legislators before they've, they've read the bill or, or acknowledge that they haven't read the bill. And is this, um, you know, your characterization of the bill is just totally false because, it, or their characterization of the bill is false. Um, there's no question that this is a, a totally different and new proposal from last time. There's also no question that the fiscal impacts are less than the prior, uh, the prior bill. But there's also no question that this is more fair to Alaskans because it protects Alaskans better on the downside while taking less revenue on the upside of those oil prices. And so I don't, um, I don't accept the characterizations made. I think they represent a short-term view of you know, you can't, you can't lose any money now when we have $15 billion in savings. And I say, look, if, if these projections are actually right, and if our belief that new production will occur, we can avoid the scenario in 10 years where we have no cash and where we've declined in revenue and declined in production. Uh, I think it's, it's more prudent and responsible to take that long-term view than to take the short-term view uh, that's being espoused um, on the other side. And then when it comes to the, the primacy bill, I don't believe that one's been filed yet, but in essence, the Clean Water Act gives the states the right to regulate, it gives the states the, the right and the ability, um, with federal government's permission, to assume primacy over clean, some Clean Water Act provisions, including the 404 permits that the Corps of Engineers currently does. Uh, we, have, we, have, we already have primacy when it comes to air. We have primacy when it comes to MPDES permits. This is one of those situations where um, sequestration is threatening to cut, you know, um, state agency or federal agency funding, including the Corps. If, if their permitting functions start to go away and our ability to grow our economy goes away because they can no longer process our permits, I think that's a risk to Alaska too. So what I've, what I've suggested is, you know, let us help you. 
Corps of Engineers will take will take primacy over for these 404 uh, permits under the Clean Water Act, so that if there are, um, you know, dirt moving operations in Alaska that need to be permitted, we'll staff up our agencies, DEC and DNR, already do this kind of permitting, um, do very similar permitting when it comes to uh, resource and road building and and all the rest. So. Uh, we're going to, the, the legislation will authorize us to seek uh, that primacy and assume that authority under the Clean Water Act. Go ahead, operator. Greg, go ahead with your question, please. Yes, uh, Governor, great night, Michael Stanton. Um I have just one question for you this morning. Um, given your past statements on school security across the state of Alaska, I'm wondering if you or your administration has any comment, or I'm curious to know what you think about House Bill 55, uh, Representative Lynn's bill, which would purportedly put uh, guns into the hands of responsible trained uh, permanent teachers and administrators at schools across the state of Alaska. Well, we already do that to some degree, right, with school resources personnel in Anchorage high schools, for example. I mean, that's already being done. so. I don't have as great a concern about that. I, I mean, I, I have, uh, um, my, my chief concern is the safety and, and security of those kids. And uh, you all know I'm a strong Second Amendment supporter, but we also, I also gotta tell you, we have officers in some schools um, with weapons, they're trained to use them. And just recently, they were instrumental in, um, averting and mitigating a situation at a high school in Anchorage. So I don't, at, at this point, I, you know, I certainly listen to what happens in the committee process and find out what happens to the bill throughout the process. But um, it's not something that, um, it, I mean, it, it's a concept that's already in place. So it's, it's not as, um, not, a, not a concern in, in the way that you've expressed it um, in, in my book. Lisa, go ahead with your question. Thank you. I just had a couple of follow-ups. Um, going back to the oil tax plan, one of the issues I'm hearing is that there's some um, skepticism about the um, revenue <coughs> forecast and the decrease, um, the prediction of a hundred thousand barrel a day decline, and that if it's and that and that um, and if that decline is not as much, um, your, your you know your figures are going to be are going to be and more skewed, and so I'm just wondering if you could address that issue about the, the decline. And coming back to the, uh, the Clean Water Act, how would that affect the double mine? So let me have uh, our Department of Revenue person, Mike Pulaski, come address the, the revenue issue first. Okay. And you may have to restate that, restate it, Lisa. Yeah, Lisa, can you restate the question for me? This is Michael Pulowski. Lisa, can you press start, start one again? Go ahead, Lisa. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, yeah, on the, um, just at the, uh, the, the revenue forecast of 100,000 barrel a day decline, that, 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 if that is off, then that, then the, the, the projections here, the, uh, of how the oil tax changes would would affect the budget are would be it would be even more extreme and they would be even more of a, a bigger hit to the treasury and I'm just wondering if, if that could be addressed. Uh, Lisa, I'm not the person that worked directly on the production forecast piece in the revenue sources book. There is a description of the joint effort that the Department of Natural Resources and the Department of Revenue undertook this year to correct the long-term over-optimism in the production forecast, which typically in the out years had ranged from 30 to 60 percent overly optimistic in future production. That was done in a highly technical and statistical manner, and it's in Chapter 4 of the Revenue Sources book, and the Department can follow up with you. Thanks. And also, Lisa, I would, I, Lisa, I would also um, say this, that if you, I think fair reporting would report that if that's if that's one side of the coin, the other side of the coin is um, we could be off on the price forecast, and we could actually be making um, more money for Alaskans, protecting Alaskans' interests on the downside of oil prices um, than the current system. So, again, take the big picture view. Take the long-term view is 
is what I am urging legislators to do here. Don't, because if, if you focus on one snapshot in time of what could be, the worst thing that could happen is we could sign the budget that I proposed today and we'd make it, you know, that I, because I, I recommended spending of a, over a billion dollars less this year than the current year. I mean, the bottom line is we have money now to cover our constitutional priorities and to reduce revenue if this fiscal summary, if the, uh, if the fiscal note is, is correct, which we believe it is at this point. We have the money now to, to do that and to change direction and increase new production. If we wait 10 years, we won't have that and we won't have new production. Uh, so this is, this is a question of really, are we, are we in this for short-term benefit or are we in this for our kids and grandkids? And I think the answer is obvious. That's good. Oh, we got it. Oh, okay. So on primacy, um, I think the answer to the question is if a Section 404 permit is, is involved, and again, it would take several years to obtain primacy. It would take multiple years to obtain primacy once we're given authority to do that. But my, my belief is that if we have primacy for 404 permitting, then yes, the state would, would do that, applying federal law to, to applying Clean Water Act standards to that permitting process. On the budget, um, you repeated your call for a lawmaker to work with you on the spending limit. Yeah. Have there been preliminary discussions on that? And secondly, in your mind, are the days of $2.8 billion capital budget lined up? Mm -hmm. um, I think there. I think those days are behind us for the near term, uh, at least, uh, given our, our downward, uh, our declining production and, and declining price as well. Uh, I have had preliminary discussions, as I've said, and, and obviously everybody um, has heard the call for the spending cap. I did it December 14 or 15 when I released the budget, done it again last night. It really is up to these caucuses now to circle up and, and arrive at what their spending limits will be. And, you know, the Senate majority, House majority, they have all been aligned on principles of fiscal restraint. I've heard that from their leadership. I've heard that from their membership. Uh, that's something that Alaskans, I think, elected us to be, is restrained fiscally with the people's money. Uh, so if we can, if we can come together on those spending limits and spending cap, I think we'll, we'll put ourselves on a firmer fiscal path um, and arrive at the end of session um, on a lower budget. Do you have a figure in mind, personally? I couldn't tell you if I did. Really, what I've done, what I've done is said, look, here's my proposal, here's my budget, the starting point, and I need you now, as caucuses um, and members, to figure out. Once you know what what's in the budget, take a look at that. Take a look at the revenue coming in across the next ten years, and then tell me what you think too. Uh, so that's that's the invitation at this point. I have not said here's my number, and that, that's not happening right now. Yeah. Yes, uh, some Democrats, um, particularly in the minority response uh, last night, have charged that um, the oil tax uh, reform proposal uh, wouldn't be guaranteed to increase production. Uh, and given the uh, fiscal notes that indicate that uh, it would immediately add um, to uh, or, excuse me, take away from uh, state revenue, uh, if it turns out that it doesn't spur production uh, as you're hoping after uh, it becomes mm -hmm. law, uh, what would you do in that uh, circumstance? So we know that the path that they support guarantees production decline. That's that's the path that the few members that you talked about um, are guaranteeing for Alaskans. The path that I have chosen and led with here is a path that says we will tax less and you'll get the maximum benefit of this tax change if you produce new, new oil. That's what the gross revenue exclusion is about. It says that Instead of taxing at 100% the new oil, we're going to tax the new oil at 80%. It's going to be 80% value times the 25% tax rate. That's how new production is um, targeted for those lower tax rates in this in this um, proposal. Yeah. Do you know that the path the other side to guarantee a production decline? It seems like all the good things are likely to happen if they go your way and all the things you don't like are guarantees of doing it. Because we have history on, on the side of that argument. We lost 6% um, production decline on it this year. We lost, on average, in the past well, few we're years as well. From fields, but the legislature, with your report, support, in some cases and without, have done a bunch of different things to track new production, and there's more companies.
companies uh, exploring than before? Yeah, so guess what? And guess what? You're right, Bob. There's a lot of good factors there, particularly when it comes to Cook Inlet. These same legislators who are opposing us in, on the North Slope didn't require any production guarantees in Cook Inlet, but they voted for them. And guess what? We have over half a billion dollars of new investment in Cook Inlet with those tax benefits. So, well, the, the guaranteed market. But, but we, but we could have just left it status quo decline, just like they're proposing to do on the North Slope. So I'm in this for new production, for new opportunities for Alaskans. I think the way to go is, is the new proposal I've made. On minerals? Yeah. Uh, should we expect a proposal from you directly or through ADA to do a kind of growth for resources support for Spokane Mountain or the rare earth elements in that Prince of Wales? So uh, my understanding of, and that uh, maybe I might have to have Karen help me on this, but my, my recollection is that we funded the inventory assessment and on, my, on rare earth elements. When it comes to Bocan Mountain specifically, uh, I believe that DOT had money for a study of um, transportation infrastructure, but I don't know exactly where that is, and I'd be happy to get some more information for you. Well, the UCOR so. people say they're talking right now with the data. It's not talking to Okay, well, I was not personally aware of that, but I frankly I'd encourage it because I want to develop our, our rare earth elements and, and the opportunities for Alaskans there, but um, I'd be happy to see if I can find out more. Okay. Bill? You've spoken many times about federal overreach. Yeah. Uh, the speaker says that the president is reaching for Alaskans' guns. What do you think about the proposal to arrest federal agents trying to enforce the president's new executive order? Okay, so you've, you've just kind of focused on the one little sound bite from one part of the bill. The other part of the bill says that um, this, that's Alaskans can lawfully keep, maintain, possess weapons under state law that they may not be able to under federal law. Um, I clearly support that provision because I'm a strong Second Amendment supporter. Uh, I signed the underlying legislation that that provision is being added to in 2010. Um, the other element I wasn't even aware of that you just mentioned until, I don't know, the last few hours. And so uh, I'd be happy to, I want to hear more about that in the committee process. So, yeah. One more question. Well, on, on, One more question. Yeah. On the issue of um, you know, passing legislation saying that uh, any federal legislation on that uh, can't be enforced under state law, wasn't the issue of nullification like one of those Andrew Jackson administration issues that was resolved? quite a long time ago. You know, how would legislation like that, in your view, um, be constitutional? Well, so far we've had that legislation on the books for two years, and it hasn't been challenged. So we'd, we'd be simply adding to existing legislation. We'd have to go now. Thank you so much. Thanks.